Well, hello, Cinemeric Nation, and welcome to Simply Cinemeric Live. I am your host, Chris Pollock, and today we're going to be talking about broaching. But not just any normal broaching, broaching on a VMC. <laughs> so, with that being said, it is absolutely disclaimer time. When you apply a load, a static load, to a bearing set, especially when the bearings are not in rotary motion, you can cause an effect called burnelling or distortion of the bearing. So with that being said, I would not proceed forward with this type of application until you've at least reached out to your machine tool OEM to find out what type of load legitimately you can put on that bearing while in a static state. Now, I am gonna show you a couple of tricks that we can help mitigate that burnelling effect and try to reduce the potential of damaging our spindle, but absolutely first step before you move forward, make sure that your spindle can handle this type of load. So with that being said, what was I trying to do here? Well, in my case, I had a little part, a little cog gear that I was manufacturing. I had to make a couple, just a handful, and I needed to do a keyway in that part. Now, initially would be, well, send it out to a broaching house. There's plenty of guys that are very capable in handling this type of functionality. However, most broaching guys aren't gonna touch this unless this is thousands of parts. And I literally had a handful to do. So I started thinking about it and I said, well, boy, if I had a shaper on my bridge port, this would be easy, but unfortunately I do not uh, anymore. I haven't had the luxury of running one in quite a few years, I'm starting to date myself. But I do have a machine tool with a programmable Z axis where I can control the feed. And there's no reason why I shouldn't be able to broach this part. And it's just aluminum. I'm not applying that much load to my machine tool. So with the old saying, necessity is the mother of invention, away I went. Now, when we start to look at this type of application, there are a couple steps that we have to do in the front end. And first and foremost, step one would be, do I have a machine with a positionable spindle? If you can't position your spindle and then hold that position while in a linear motion, it's gonna make broaching very difficult. We certainly need to be able to hold that position. So, your machine doesn't have to be infinitely positionable. Mine happens to be. We're going to show you some tricks we can do with that. But as long as you can position to a location like an M19 or a tool change orient location, and the system, upon achieving this orient position, locks the spindle and will allow us to do a G1 feed move, then we can broach. Without this, you're pretty much out of luck. However, if you have a machine with a tool changer, but most likely you will be able to handle this type of application. Now, in my case, on my machine, I happen to have the ability of also positioning my spindle to any angular location. So that's going to allow me a little bit more flexibility when I get into the broaching application because now I can broach at many different orientations. So we're going we're to show you that. But again, step one, your machine tool has to be able to position the spindle hold that location while in a feed move. Next step is you gotta figure out how you wanna actually broach or hold, you know, what kind of tool you wanna use for this application. So initially, I, my first gut reaction would be, hey, I'll grab some square stock, grind up a nice little forming tool, little broach. However, if we've ever tried to hold a square tool and a round tool holder, that can be certainly challenging. So I started going through thinking out the application and decided, you know what? Why won't I, couldn't I make this out of round stock? Certainly a lot easier to hold in an end mill. Um, grinding purposes, there was a little extra material I'd have to grind, but not that much. So I chose to go with round high speed steel tool stock as opposed to your traditional square tool stock. I first looked to see what was available on the market space as far as tooling to just buy something. Very challenging, especially when you're looking at just a single cutting edge style brooch. That was why I went down the road of making my own. So here, this is the design I came up with, thinking that might give you guys some ideas if you have to do this type of application. Certainly in designing the tool, I needed to know what my nominal keyway width would be my case, it was 420 thou. So with that, I knew that I needed to get that top flat surface 
and the two lands or flat sides of the tool at the 420 thou. I didn't want to go any narrower because I didn't want to have to shift my other linear axes to cut on either side of the, of the keyway. I wanted to be able to cut this in one shot. So for me, it was pretty easy. I just said, you know what? I'll push the diameter surface down until my cross section gets to the point where I have a 420 thou flat. Next step, I did want to have a little bit of margin or land on either side of the tool to stabilize it. Originally, I designed it with 100 thou. I ended up grinding it down probably to 40 or 50 thou. Um, that was really a function of that relief I put in, that 10 degree per side relief that you see there on the tool. Um, I wanted to reduce the amount of pressure or friction on the tool I was, was engaging. So you can play with that for sure. But the business end is certainly going to be the tip of this brooch. So I wanted to make sure I had enough relief that I could get a nice positive curl to my chip. So I did a 60 degree relief that you see coming off the, the front. Now the overall brooch length, in my case I did two, but I only had to go inch and a quarter deep. I decided to go two this way. I could always dress that 60 degree face surface further back as my tool starts to wear and I lose my cutting edge on it. Um, and also it makes the tool a little more flexible if I happen to find another nominal keyway that I want to cut that was maybe a little bit deeper. So I took the round stock over to the surface grinder, started cranking my handles away, and sure enough, came up with my tool. Now, once the tool's been created, it's time to actually define it in the control and set it up and work with this tool. So, we'll pop this in our spindle. I do want to pay attention to the orientation position because last thing I want to do is clock that 180 degrees out. And we now have to build the tool. Now, in my machine, I actually have this commissioned for turning tools. So certainly I could have created this as a turning tool. Here you see some different boring bars. If you ever saw the YouTube live I did on interpolation turning, there I was really treating the machine as if it was a lathe. But I didn't want to go that route because a lot of people don't have turning tools commissioned on their standard machining center or milling machine. So I decided to build this just as a simple end mill. Now, I wanted to have a nominal diameter because later I'm going to show you a little more advanced programming where I could actually compensate for the radius of the tool. So I'm going to set some kind of tool length. I need to know that. Now, my machine is set up for positive tool lengths. I'm a big advocate of positive tool lengths. Um, for one, it allows me to move tools to uh, different machine tools. I can preset externally. So for, for my case, I'm working from gauge line to the tool tip. That's your five inches. I was able to use my Marplus presetter to find out and datum that surface, especially since it was an end mill. I was able to use that. But I do have to pay attention to finding the diameter, which would really be the center line to this flat surface, I need to make sure that I don't try to run that off the presetter because it will spin the tool. So that I do not want to do. Um, so that 272, that really is a function of when I designed the tool. It's two times that 136 offset. But, you know, when you're grinding it, you might not be holding it to that tight a tolerance. So I would say you're going to want to measure that surface. So a quick down and dirty way, certainly in the Cinemera control to find that radius, is inside a jog, under our measure tool, we have a diameter manual. It's probably one of the least used functions in the tool setup, but in this application it works great. Because what I could do is I could just set up a temporary datum to some fixed point, right side of my jaw. Then I can move the machine over and touch the flat of that tool, obviously with it oriented parallel, to the side of this zero location, and the machine then calculates the diameter knowing where the spindle is in relation to that. So that was how I came up with my offset value there. And then obviously I can gauge that in when I come down and probe the, the, the side of the wall of this keyway slot. If I'm undersized, I can adjust the radius of my tool accordingly at that point. Now, the next step and actually probably the first step um, before I really start touching things is how do I clock or orient that tool? So let's say, by argument's sake, you happen to be on a machine that does not have a positionable spindle. You can only orient it to one location and hold that. Easiest way I've found to do that is to keep your ER collet nut a little loose 
loose enough that you can slide this tool, right? That I could spin the tool. Not so loose that it'll fall out. You wanna be able to hold that linear position the best you can. Move the machine over again to some datum surface that's parallel with the groove surface or the keyway slot that you're about to cut. Then you can just slowly bring her in, adjusting the tool back and forth until it is perfectly flat against your gauge surface or your little datum surface. Snug up the nut just so it doesn't move. Bring her out, move her over to your, your fixture to tighten it, snug her up, and you'll be able to hold it based on that M19 or your orient position, whatever your command happens to be in your control. Now for me, I was able to take advantage of the fact that I have a positioning spindle, maybe cheat a little bit. I trammed or indicated the flat end I just kept moving my spindle and then whatever angular value I found I needed to adjust, I can put that in my work coordinate level. So on my G54, not only do I find the center of my part, top of my part, but I'm adjusting the spindle orientation. This will not affect the M19 orient for tool change. So it's independent of that. I'm not gonna mess up my tool change, at least on my machine configuration. But what I can do is drive the position. So now everything's working off of a three o'clock position being zero. The rotation of the spindle, I have zero, 90, 180, 270. So it does work backwards to what you would be thinking about because it's spindle rotation, right? And clockwise positive is in a clockwise direction, standard cutting tool. So just keep that in mind, right? Zero, 90 degrees. So wherever I send my machine, you now if I go back to this little position and I told it, hey, I want you to position to an angle of zero, the offset in there is what's driving it. So now I'm parallel with this surface. If I go to 180, now I'm going to be parallel with that surface. So we're just bouncing back and forth. And now I can infinitely control. So I'm going to show you a little example in a minute where I can actually do potentially four grooves. I could do a spline this way if I wanted to. Certainly makes it pretty powerful. Okay. So we've come through, we've talked about tool setup a bit, how I datumed it, how I adjusted it, came up with my offsets. Now the next step is taking a look at the part programs. So for me, I wanted to create a couple examples for you guys. So the first example I decided would be a very kind of basic example. If I found myself on a machine tool that had just one fixed orientation. So I needed to, to basically lay out the part program with that in mind, right? So as I come down through and write it, this will only ever cut a groove in one orientation because I have that one static location. So I did it in G-code. It could have been done in conversational, but you would have added a whole bunch of independent lines. So I think a scenario like this is probably a little easier in G-code. So standard safety line, work please blank for graphics, all the normal stuff you've seen me talk about. Loaded the tool, we saw the tool definition. Did my tool change. Now. I did use a command that's a little unique, and you guys probably haven't seen this before. I certainly haven't presented it to anybody. Um, it is called the F-line command. So just hold on to that one for a second. We'll talk about that in a minute. Then I just set up my feed rate. So I'm doing a G94 linear feed. Certainly I can't do feed forever because my spindle is not spinning. Came down into position. Now on my machine, I'm positioning it with my SP1 equals zero. So SP1 is the designed or defined name of my spindle by the OEM. So you see that right here, SP1. So I can now control the spindle position by calling out that axis. If you're on a machine that doesn't have that, this would be your position to give it your M19 orient to get that tool into orientated position. I moved over and now in this first basic example, I'm not taking any radius compensation into account. So I needed to calculate where the edges of this broaching tool would be on the part just as it starts to engage. So it's certainly lower than the half inch diameter. And then I have to take into account the radius of the tool to shift it back. So I really kind of eyeballed it, came up with this 315 thou value. That would be the physical true position of the center line of the spindle at that point. I created a little label or a loop that I can keep repeating, fed down, cutting my first cut. And then what I did was I used an incremental shift in my X. We happen to have a non-modal command where I can say, hey, whatever 
If you're an absolute, I incrementally want to shift just this component with my IC command. So I just backed it off 20 thou, because remember I took a first cut, pulled it up. If you don't use an IC command, you're just going to switch from G90 to G91 and then back to G90, a couple extra steps. I pull up to a clearance plane. I'm now positioning, and this is another little trick I'll talk about once we start running it. So just hold tight on these two little position commands. But once I'm basically back at my zero location, I then move back the amount I pulled off the surface plus my chip load. So that's where you see 22,000. So I'm really taking a 2,000 chip load. You are not going to light the world on fire with pressure you're putting on this. Certainly, I, I, I probably cut this one in aluminum. I think I did as much as a 5,000 chip load, but I don't want to put that much static load on my bearing. So I've been using about 2,000. Um, certainly, it takes a little longer. This is not about speed. This is about necessity, right? So there's the end of my little loop. So I just did a quick little repeat command looping that, that tool path over and over again 50 times, or however many times I needed to take from my starting point to get to my ending location of my brooch. So if I'm moving over 2 thou every time, 50 thou of a loop, that means I'll have moved over 100 thou to take my last brooch. So this is a very basic example. Uh, wrap it up, shut my coolant off, shut my, end my program, away I go. So let's take a quick look at what the running of this part would look like. All right. So here you see I'm orienting into position. Now I got the coolant shut off right now, but by all means you are going to want to run coolant with this application and you're going to want to run coolant that has a, a nice high lubricity. Oh, I haven't switched the screen. Ah, there you go. So now you can see it. So here um, I'm actually using my Motorex. It's the uh, SimCool 3000. I find it has a very, very high lubricity on a lot of these obscure applications that I find myself getting into. So something for you guys to check out. You'll get to see that when we do the actual cutting. Now, a couple things I want you to notice here. First, as I pull off, you see how I spin the spindle? So we were talking about that static load of the bearing that I'm putting on the bearing. And certainly, I wanted to keep from pushing on the same point of the bearing every single pass, 100 passes through this broaching operation. So what I do is I just spinner one revolution, and that is changing the orientation position of those bearings. So it keeps me from hitting the same point between the outer race and the actual ball bearing itself. Hopefully mitigating that Brunelling effect. Now the next thing I want you to take a look at, that is the F line command. So watch the feed as I come down through it. So I'm gonna crank her up a little faster, and you see I'm accelerating Hopefully you guys can see it. I'm accelerating over the length of the move. So the Cinemaric Control has a cool function where I can actually say, hey, take whatever your previous feed was and your commanded feed, and instead of executing it immediately, apply it over the length of the move. What I found in this application is instead of hitting it hard and then maintaining that feed, I was able to come into it at a lighter feed once I got the broach engaged to material, then I can accelerate up my load and it was much easier on the axes. Before I was going at a decent rate of speed, man, you, you could hear it hitting. And then from there, we're just gonna keep looping over and over, positioning over the two thou after every pass until we get to our final position. Now, for this, I am pretty limited, right? This is written just in an X positive direction I don't have a lot of range of what I can do with the part. So I figured, you know what, let me show you a little bit more advanced programming techniques. And what this is going to allow me to do, this is going to allow me to now explore how I can make this program a little more dynamic. So if we take a quick look over at, oops, wrong button, over at our programming environment, I created a parametrically driven or a variable program-based program to handle this task. And if you guys are interested in getting into more of this, keep an eye out on the cnc for you channel. Uh, we do offer a variable programming class virtually online where you can attend and um, actually sit in. It's a multi-day class, or we are going to hopefully open up our classes soon to offer it physically at our Elk Grove Village facility. But here, this is kind of the things that you would learn a little bit. 
So what I did was I created some local variables, that is that definition statement, and those local variables now allow me to push in adjustment parameters into this little mini cycle that I've just created, right? So I'm giving it my starting radius location, and this is my true radial position on the part, not this adjusted position based on the tool geometry. My end radius, so now if I knew exactly where that surface, that nominal edge of that surface was going to be radially from the center of the bore, I just plug that value right in. I can now define my chip load and change it and adjust it just by changing this one step variable. My depth increment is my position move down or how deep I'm going to be grooving. And now I have a little angle orientation field. So now I can start to move this around anywhere I want. The program itself, when I come down, I'm going to use the coordinate system to now stage this. So I wrote it as if the brooch is going to be broaching at a um, three o'clock position the whole time but now I can clock the coordinate system so I can make three o'clock be actually at any angle. So I do that with a rock command, and then I just wanna match my spindle angle to that location. So that's what allows me to now clock it in different positions. The actual movement is identical to what you just saw before, but here I can now take in my start radius and add in the active tool radius, that's a system variable. So the, the program will compensate. So now I can adjust the tool geometry and it'll adjust the resulting tool path without me having to kind of fudge the numbers to get it to come into spec. So that's where this tool radius comes in. I did throw myself up a little counter. That was the R variable I was using, just so I could see the number of passes. This is just a message command. So we're gonna get a nice little message displayed across the top of the screen. My, oops, let me go back, hit the wrong key. Ah. So I was in the message command, my depth, back off. So this is all very similar to what you just saw, just really adding in the variables. So the end result is now, wherever I put that angle and obviously adjust my passes, I can now have a fully dynamic cycle. So now you see I'm broaching at 90 degrees. I'm using the same clocking spin to mitigate my Brunelling effect. I am accelerating down my brooch, just like we saw before. But now, with these couple parameters, I can quickly make this program very dynamic, right? So maybe I want to do 180 degrees. Oops. Execute. And there you see now I'm moving over. So as far as the control's concerned, I'm always positioning in an x-positive direction. That was where I clocked my coordinate. I get a little message command there. Oh, I am showing this stuff and I didn't move over, sorry. So there is my 180. So I get a little message command showing me I'm at 180. I had just shown you 90 and you didn't get a chance to see it. So let's show you real fast. We'll make the change down to 90. Oops. Trying to do this stuff at an angle is always challenging. All right. So our variable program now allows me to really adapt this. And, and like I said earlier, I could use this for splines now, right? I could come in and do however many splines I needed to go right around my part. I would obviously cut one to completion the way this was methodized, but gives you kind of an example of what could be done when you get into some of these more advanced levels of programming. Okay, so what you haven't seen is me take a cut. But I thought it would be appropriate to certainly machine a real part here at the end. Um, it's not going to light the world on fire. Let's face it, it's just broaching, but we do want to do that. So I'm going to start setting it up. If you guys have questions, certainly throw them into the chat window. While I set it up, we'll get it running and we'll take a look at some of your chat. Okay, so in my case, I'm going to jump out the jog. I'm going to swap out my part and I'm going to use my nice Marpost presetter, my part setter to allow me to find the part quickly. So I don't have any zeros or datums located. I do want to kind of clock it in a desired position, but obviously since my program can allow me to adjust it, I could quickly adjust that location there. Let's go grab our probe. 
All right, I'm using my TSM screen to rapidly tool change. Um, otherwise, I could certainly do it through MDI. So there's two datum surfaces I need to have right now. I need to know the top of the part. So I'm just gonna come down and, and kind of watch how fast I can set this up. You know, this is why I am a huge advocate for probes on a machine tool. It is so much quicker than coming down, trying to drag a piece of, a piece of material off of off of a tool, like a shim stock, right? I just jump into here, say, hey, I want to set Z, set Z to zero on G54 cycle start. It's going to bounce that probe off of that surface. Then I can just drop it in the bore, find my next measurement. So here it adjusted the work offset. I'm going to come over, drop in the hole. You just want to kind of eyeball the probe in the center, make sure it'll contact. I go into our little Whole measuring cycle, cycle start. Now it's going to hit four points. I decided to measure this at a 45. I could certainly control that however I would want to do this probing strategy. It's going to set zero. Now keep in mind the way I wrote this program, zero has to be the center of the whole feature. So if I was going to make this into a little cycle or routine, maybe I needed to broach in points that weren't dead center of the part. I would probably just set a linear transformation to that point in space. That would allow me to obviously position it to a new location and still use the same cycle. All right, so we'll take a look at our part program. We're gonna do the variable brooch. Uh, we'll do it at 90 degrees, that should be all good. All right, grab the brooch out of our tool mag. I will turn on a little bit of coolant because we're going to cut now. Not a lot, just want to keep some nice lubricity on that tool, right? And we'll close the doors, keep it splashing. And there we go. So she's going to now continue to loop that process until I hit a linear position of 0.464, that would give me the 600 thou radially for that back surface. So with that, while it's running, let's take a quick look at the chat. Um, okay, so the, uh, fer the feral engineer, very nice cat picture, looks just like you. I do know who the feral engineer is says, I've done it where I rewrite orient position and then reset it before tool change. Certainly that is a, a step you could do. Kind of scary to me, um, but that could be done. Uh, being able to position the spindle is way easier. I think we need an easy screen for this. I would agree. Uh, an easy screen would be a custom screen that could be developed. Um, certainly a, it would be nice to take this little cycle I made and kind of fully rework it. Um, Andy's saying hi. Um, what do you have in the tool page for the rotation of the tool? So the rotation of the tool, what he's referring to is in our offset table. We do have right over here a column at the very end for rotation. However, that rotation doesn't matter. So anything on this far end is not being actually utilized if I'm in a G-code program. If I was in a conversational program, I would have to make sure that that tool is at a stop. But you can see I have clockwise, it's not spinning because I'm controlling it with M3 and M5. Um, I don't see a Y axis move there. So it is it only for 90 degree increments and in angle? So no, um, that's a very good question. So the program itself, if I take a look at it real quick. So you see right here how I have this rot I'm rotating the coordinate system to any angle. So X can be just an X move. It could be a Y move, like you're seeing right here, right? Or it could be an X, Y move. The system will, will just handle that automatically. My part program is written as if it's just an X move, but by rotating around the Z, I can position it to anywhere I want. Okay, um, looking real quick. I think that's all we have from a chat perspective here. If you guys have any of our questions while we're wrapping up here, looks like we're right around on time. 
So you can start to see the grooves coming in. Can you see? Yeah, you can start to see it here. Obviously, uh, not going to light the world on fire with cycle timer speed here, nor am I trying to. We're at uh, 414, 418. I'm ending at 446. So we can let it run off. You guys can see the rest of it. I certainly appreciate everybody taking time to come out and join me today. I have a lot of fun with these events. Hopefully you do too. Uh, if you like them, please don't uh, forget to subscribe to the channel, like the event, and certainly share it to all of your friends and colleagues. Um, anywhere you can give us some suggestions for maybe some more material, we're always open to that as well. All right, so we are almost there. About another 30 thou. You should be able to start seeing. I wish I had a little bit of light in there. Probably should get a little more light. And next time we'll add, we'll add a light to it. Um, that, that top view is a little shadow. So 448, 450. And we'll show you the final keyway when we're all said and done here. And then we'll wrap it up. Um, oh, Andy said, nice. Is there a conversational version of the rot line? There is. Uh, I want to say it's under various. So if you're in a conversational program, now you guys can see the key. I'll uh, shut our cooling off. Maybe just blow her off with a little bit of air so you can get a chance to see it. Uh, you can start to see the keyway we're producing there. Um, so if you were in a program, conversational, or what we call shop mill, we have the ability of rotating the coordinate system. And I thought it was in various uh, doo -doo -doo, transformations, rotation. So here I could do the same type of command as my rotten G code. So I could rotate the coordinate system. Okay. So with that being said, again, thank you very much for spending time and hanging out with me. Um, remember to share, like, subscribe, and we'll see you guys next time. You take it easy and have a good weekend. And happy uh, 4th of July to everyone.